Good morning to all of you, my dear students. We have 20 students and counting. Welcome to Data Common Network Management lab session. Uh, the lab session is uh, sort of independent from the theory, okay? Uh, what you study in the lab consists of uh, a particular uh, order, which is uh, Cisco certified network associate CCNA, Cisco certificate, uh, CCNA one, okay, introduction to networking. So this is what you're going to study. My name is Ford and I'm uh, a certified uh, uh, Cisco instructor um, in MIRI. Uh, we have got two uh, Cisco certified instructors. One is Mr. Veramani, and the other one is myself. Okay. My name is Fad Motalabi, and I'll be your uh, lab instructor for uh, Cisco. Okay. Uh, if you look at the unit outline for Datacom, you can see that the assessment is divided into two components. 50% uh, is for what you study in the lecture and tutorial. Uh, Dr. Han will be teaching you that. And 50% will be under uh, <coughs> CCNA 1, okay? So <coughs> this is uh, uh, independent of what happens in PERT, actually. The lab session uh, is nothing to do with PERT. PERT follows their own uh, lab session and we follow our own lab session. Of course, the lab exercises are the same, but <clears throat> the tests and the exams will be set by the inst your instructor. For example, in PERT, the instructor will be someone else. Uh, <clears throat> here in MIRI, your instructor is uh, Ford. Okay, that's me. Okay. Uh, whereby I create the class and I set the uh, students and all that, okay? And even the exam time and date can be set uh, by the instructor, which is me, okay? So if you get emails uh, from PERT that you have got this lab exam at such and such day, just ignore it, okay? Because that is for the PERT students. For us, uh, uh, I will be setting the uh, timetable for the chapter exams and so on. Now, what what I'm telling you is is something new. Perhaps uh, <clears throat> you haven't studied this before. Uh, let me just introduce the concepts of uh, what we are going to study. If you look at uh, CCNA, okay. Cisco Certified Network Associate consists of three levels. This is the latest one, CCNA 7.0. The first level is called CCNA 1, Introduction to Networking. The second one is CCNA uh, 2, which is Introduction to Routing and Switching. Okay, and the, one, the third one is CCNA 3. Okay, more in depth, it goes inside uh, your uh, security and routing and switching. So when you look at these three, uh, this is something that you're going to learn in Datacom. CCNA1 is what we're going to do in Datacom. At the end of this, you get a certificate. Uh, beside, uh, besides uh, your marks that you get the 50%, if you have successfully completed these uh, chapter exams, you see there are 17 chapters, okay? And <clears throat> they are all associated with um, an exam. And at the end of the semester, uh, there will be uh, uh, two exams. One is an uh, online exam, and the other one is an online skill-based exam where I will give you a problem and you have to solve it within three hours, okay? Uh, having finished that, you will get a certificate. For example, in, in this course for CCNA1, you will get one certificate which says that 
this student has finished CCNA 1. Now, those of you who are doing distributed networking, then you will be learning CCNA 2 and CCNA 3 over there. Okay? So what we're interested in is CCNA 1, Introduction to Networking. Okay? So this is what we're starting with today, networking today. Okay? So every week, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, <clears throat> go through uh, two chapters. Okay, for example, I will start with uh, your group, which is 8 a.m. group, networking today. And then in the afternoon one, I will do the second one, basic switch and end device configuration. No problem for you. You, you won't miss it because I'm recording it. So you're going to watch it later. So in the 8 a.m. group, I will be going with all the odd ones, okay? Chapter 1, Chapter 3, Chapter 5. And with the afternoon group, all the even ones. So you have to catch up, okay, by going through the recordings that I put on Moodle. Okay, my dear students? That's how we'll play this. At the end of this semester, you have to be very good with all these concepts, okay? You should know how to create a basic network. You should know how to do IP addressing. Both versions, IP version 4 addressing and IP version 6 addressing, okay? So these basics you have to understand, okay? Networking is actually very easy and uh, very rewarding, and there is a big demand for it. So doing CCNA1, having that certificate in your hand itself has got a lot of value, okay, for your future. So this is the industry standard, actually. If you talk about networking, uh, the industry standard is Cisco Certified Network Associate, okay? Having said that, we are going to start with today's session, okay? Uh, today's session, we are going to start with networking today. Now, before I start, anyone has any questions they would like to ask? We have 22 students. Okay. Yes, yes, you need to download a software, but not yet. I'll tell you how and when. Today, we are going to create a new identity for you on NetAcad. NetAcad is Cisco's uh, academy. Okay? You see, again, I told you, as an instructor, I'm going to create for you a new Network Identity on Cisco NetAcad, which is an online presence where you will officially be doing this. Once I create for you an identity on there, then you can start actually going through the topics. Okay, you can go at your own pace. And most important, you can also do the chapter exams, which I will be releasing as we go. The chapter exams, my dear students, don't worry about it. It's open book. You can actually study and give the exam at the same time. There are certain rules like you have to get at least 75% to pass, okay? And you cannot mess that up. Uh, if, you, uh, if you get less than 75, it's fail, okay? Even for your final exam, which is an online exam, uh, that is also passing mark is 75, okay? Your skill-based exams, see three exams, chapter exams uh, and final exam and skill-based exam. The skill-based exam at the end of the semester, I will give you a problem, something that you will be exposed to throughout your lab sessions that you do. I'll be giving you a problem and you have to 
troubleshoot that problem. You have to make sure that the computers can communicate with each other, can ping to each uh, with each other. As long as they can ping with each other, that means you pass, okay? And then, you know, you, uh, you get that certificate. And um, for the past, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this unit since been taking it since uh, uh, a long time now. And this is the unit where the passing percentage is uh, usually 100%, particularly because of the Cisco component. Students do very well in the Cisco component. In the theory component, they may not do as well as the Cisco component, okay? But you have to understand, you have to do both. You have to be good at both. The theory that you study in the lecture and tutorial are the concepts that sometimes we'll be repeating this over here as well in uh, the individual chapters that we go through. We'll be repeating it over here as well. Now, here in the lab session, you will be doing the actual uh, <clears throat> networking skills that are needed by using a specific uh, software, which just now you asked, do I need to install any software? Yes, you have to install a software. And that software, I didn't want you to install earlier because I want you to download a fresh copy from your NetACAD. Now, NetACAD is the Cisco Networking Academy website where Everything happens, okay? As long as you are registered by an instructor, your instructor is for, that is me. Once your instructor creates an identity, you will be under NetACAD and you can go in and have an identity and do all the exams. And your instructor will keep marking you. He will enter your marks. And if the instructor is happy with your achievement, he will um, tick a few buttons and then that's it, you're done. You will get your certificate, okay? So it's, it's very simple. So today, uh, we will also create an identity for you on NetACAD, okay? So it's going to be an interesting session. I hope most of you uh, <coughs> will like it. Uh, first things first, let's start with today's first uh, lecture, we'll be going through some concepts of networking, a basic introduction to networking. Now, I hope I have your attention. I'll start today's session now. Uh, we'll be looking at networks, <laughs> why, why they affect our lives, okay? Uh, we'll look at some of the components. We will look at topologies of networks. Uh, topologies are important because even every lab that you do every week, we will be giving you uh, instruction to do this based on a diagram, which is a topology, okay, consisting of a network. You have to simulate that by using a specific software known as Packet Tracer. We will look at some of the common types of networks. What is internet connection? Uh, how do we, what are the requirements for a reliable network? Uh, some of the trends that we have like Beyond, bring your own device. We'll look at the most important component of networks, which is security, okay? And some of the <clears throat> professional certifications. So let's start. You cannot imagine uh, today's environment without uh, networks. Any, any enterprise you go, an important component of that enterprise, an important department is the ICT department, okay? And one of the main tasks they have is responsible for networking. Every company has got one particular person, a network engineer who's responsible for the network of the whole company. And that network engineer most probably is doing that job because he has finished his CCNA1, CCNA2, CCNA3. 
Just having your CCNA one, two, and three, you can get a very good job with a very good pay scale. Okay, that is for someone without a degree. Even you can you can go and check in the industry. Okay, and as you go along and continue getting more experience in this job, your chances for a higher pay increases, okay? Because a company cannot survive without network. It needs a network engineer. And that's why, my dear students, you're here studying this, okay? We cannot imagine our life without a network, without the internet. Look at all of us at different places, joined together on an online class at 8 a.m. in the morning. What do you think we are doing over here? We are, we, are, we are having an online lab session. How is that possible? Because of networks. The science of communication has really advanced, okay? More than anything else. All of us have our own personal <laughs> mobile device, okay? If the science of transportation would have advanced, all of us should have our own personal aeroplane. But because of advancement in communication, okay, networks and the internet has changed our life and it keeps coming out with new uh, technologies and it keeps surprising us every time. Uh, if you look at our world, can we say that it's a world without boundaries? Yes, when it comes to internet, there is no boundaries. Some of you are not here in Miri, but you're still attending the class, okay? I have not gone back to the campus since, uh, when was it? Uh, July or August of last year but I've been conducting classes. How is that possible? Because of the, you know, the, the benefit of networks. You can create uh, <laughs> communication tools. You can, you can um, create, you can publish something uh, on the internet from here and the whole world can go through it. You can just create a silly video in your garden with your dog and upload it and on YouTube and, you know, in a distant place like Brazil, a small kid with a uh, handphone can see your video, okay? A global community, true. So this, this tool that we have, we, we have never had uh, something like that, okay? And this is made possible by computers connected, connecting to each other, okay? Now, how networks happen? That is what you're here to study, okay? So you are on your way to be a network engineer. So you have to know your basics. How do I make a computer network happen? By using certain components. The most important component is of course the computer, okay? A device. Can be a computer, can be a smartphone, can be any device with a microprocessor. Now, a computer can have two roles. It can be a client or a server, okay? A server is a special computer that gives data as per the request of a client, okay? A server can be an email server, a web server, a file server, a print server, Okay, 
there's so many other so many roles sometimes a computer can have so many uh, not just one single role but mul multiple roles okay a client is a computer that accesses the information from a server okay now if you look at what we are doing right now we are using a cisco webex system which is a distributed system all of us are connected to one server okay all of us are client on one server and that server is making us communicate with each other with ease you can hear me sitting anywhere in the world as long as you have access to the internet how is that possible because of this distributed system that we call webex okay so the most important aspect of a network is a host a computer a device which can be a client or a server not necessarily a client or a server it can also be two clients connected to each other as a peer-to-peer -peer network as you can see over here you have got two computers connected to each other this is for example connected to a printer this is having all the files you can access the files over here or you can access this and do some printing okay so it cannot necessarily be a peer-to-peer -peer. it can uh, it can be a client server it can be a peer-to-peer -peer, or it can be a mixture of both client and server and peer-to-peer -peer. okay if you have heard about distributed systems it, it's a combination of both of them okay usually we have peer-to-peer -peer for smaller networks okay for today you'll be creating a simple peer-to-peer -peer network i'll be asking you to download packet tracer install it on your computer and connect two computers with each other that's it <coughs> sorry now this is what a network looks like okay look at what we have over here look at the diagram carefully we have got computers computers connected you see this could be a server these are the clients and they're connected to one device okay and there's another phone called ip telephone this is another device all these devices okay the five devices are connected to a square object now this is called a switch okay new term a switch a switch is where all the components of a local area network are connected okay so what is a switch a switch is a network device that connects devices on the same network see this is one LAN. this is another switch where you have another LAN. one two three four five another five devices connected to another switch so this is a switch whenever you see this square object you should know that this is a switch okay a switch is used to connect devices on the same network so same network all the devices connected to switch same network all the devices connected to the switch the term i'm using is same network what what does that mean same network that means the logical address given to all these devices will be belonging to the same type to the same subnet mask okay we'll be learning more about that so if 
in the beginning, some things are confusing. Don't worry about it. By the end of this semester, you'll be experts. Okay, I guarantee you that. So look over here. All the devices on the same network connected to a switch. All the devices on the same network connected to a switch. So the IP address of this will be, for example, 192.168.1.1.2.3.4.5. Okay. This one perhaps can be 192.168.2.1.2.2.2.3.2.4 and so on. Something like that. Okay. Then what is this circular device? Why do we need this circular device? Uh-huh. This circular device has got a special name. It is called a router. Now, what is a router? A switch is used to connect similar network devices to each other for a local area network. A router is used to connect two different networks to each other. Remember that. I'll be asking you until the end of the semester. Okay. A router, a router connects two networks which are different. Okay. This one was one zero group. This is two zero group. 192.168.1.0 network. 192.168.2.0 network. Okay? So, they are different networks. How do you connect them together? If you connect this switch to this switch, they will never communicate with each other. Because they belong to different networks. In order to make the communication in different networks happen, you have to use a special device, which is a router and internet exists because of your routers okay so your internet exists because of these routers what is internet interconnection of all these routers all around the world okay makes internet possible. So the moment you get out of your local area network, you need this device, a router, okay? So this is what makes your internet possible. Now, let's talk about the intermediary devices. Now, I introduce to you the concept of uh, LAN. Now, LAN, in order to make it happen, you need a switch. Switch is a device, okay, which allows you to connect all the devices in the network together, okay? In so sort of a star connection, star topology, where all the devices will be connected. For example, if your switch has got 24 ports, okay? If your switch has got 24 ports, you can connect 24 computers to it. A router is used to connect two separate networks with each other, okay? I'll be asking you over and over again, my dear students, as we go along in this course, okay? Switch connects devices on the same network. Router connects devices on different networks. We also have a wireless router. We also have a, a firewall. We also have a multi-layer switch and so on. Besides these intermediary devices, we also have Cables, specific, special cables, okay? We have uh, network cables in form of copper cables, which are UTP cables. Now, these UTP cables can be UTP, which is unshielded twisted pair, 
or STP, shielded twisted pair. And you'll be surprised, my dear students, we have these UTP cables ever since the 80s, okay? We have been using them and they have survived until today because the market, it's very popular in the market, okay? Even if you go, any enterprises you go, even you go to our campus, you will see a crisscross of these cables, these UTP cables everywhere, okay? If you have a basic, if you are in Malaysia and you have Unify, even if you look at your own computer, you will see that <laughs> from your uh, from your switch, there will be perhaps a cable, a UTP cable going to other devices, okay? Besides that, we have also fiber optic cable, which is uh, very popular now, and which is being the frame, which is uh, actually the building block and the framework of the whole uh, World Wide Web right now, okay? And we also have wireless. If we look at, I think I have a, uh, I think we'll go to that later. The fiber optic cables actually are being laid out all around the world, okay? You can look at, uh, this is the cabling of the uh, whole world, you see? Most of the cables that we have um, are old copper cables, you know, the old telephone cables, which still exist under the sea all around the world. You can see the connection. But now you can see these are the new wife, uh, uh, sorry, uh, optical cables laid down all around the world. Now look at Malaysia, okay? And the island of Borneo, okay? Look at the connections being laid out. And this is still continuing. Now, these are special cables that are laid out under the sea. Now, unfortunately, the old cables are not in good enough. Okay? So now, we are changing to uh, fiber optic cables. Why? Why fiber optic? Because their bandwidth is much, much higher, okay? They can carry so many uh, signals without much, uh, without distortion, okay? That's why this new framework is being laid out all around the world, okay? If you want to design a network, you should know how to draw a topology, okay? So, representing a network is very important, okay? No matter what device you use, very important aspect of that device is a network interface card, okay? No matter what device you use, an IP phone, a desktop computer, a laptop, a wireless tablet, a uh, network TV, a printer, all of them has, have got one common device, which is a network interface card, okay? And I see, I think I, uh, there. This is your network interface card. You, know, you can just Google it and I see, you will see this picture. This is a D-Link uh, network interface card, okay? This one is a PCI slot, goes on your desktop, PCI slot. You can have a look. This is where your UTP connection happens. If you have a wireless 
system, then you have a wireless network interface card. Now, every NIC has got a MAC hardware address, which cannot be changed. This is fused inside the system. A unique address, which is unique in the whole world. Okay? Now, the question is, how do they make it unique that there is no copy? We'll study that. There is a way that they do that. Okay? So, once you have this device and a MAC address, which is unique, now your job is to give it a logical address. What is a logical address? I just told you. 192.168.1.1. That one is a logical address. Now, again, when you give a logical address, there are two ways you can do that. Either you give an IP version 4 address, like 192.168.1.1, or you give a new address, which is IP version 6 address. Now you will say, hey, it's confusing. Why do we have IP version 4? Why do we have IP version 6? Why can't we stick to 1? The answer is very simple. Because IP version 4 addresses are being exhausted. We have got so many devices, so many <laughs> IoT devices that you cannot have uh, enough IP version 4 public addresses. That is why they have come out with a new IP addressing scheme known as IP version 6. Okay? For an internal network, you can still use IP version 4. But if your device is going to be on the internet, on the public domain, you have to use IP version 6. So in this course, you have to be good in both IP version 4 and IP version 6. Okay? Now, no excuses over here, my dear students. If you cannot do a proper IP addressing, okay, IP version 6 is very straightforward and very uh, easy to understand. But IP version 4 is a bit tricky. You just have to listen to my instructions and understand how to do the proper calculation. Now, if you cannot do that, then you don't get, you don't pass this unit. Okay? But this has never happened before. Um, everybody passes <laughs> the unit because, you know, they, they, they follow the instructions and they do the calculations properly. Okay, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So here is your network interface card. Remember, it has got a hardware MAC address fused in it. Okay, physical address. Besides that, you can give a logical address to your network. Okay. No matter which device, all of them have got a network interface card. Okay, some devices have got more than one, okay, like a switch or a router. So, another thing you should know is the network representation. A desktop computer will look like this. A wireless router will look like this. A wireless cable will look like this. This one is a special cable, which is straight through cable. Okay, a straight through cable is a special cable where both the connections, the wiring, will, the wiring will be the same. The eight wires will be paired in the same way. There's another cable which is crossover. In crossover, both the end, ends of the cable, the wiring is not the same. There's a special pattern. We'll study that as well. If you're connecting from one LAN to another LAN, okay, then you may have a specific connection, which is a serial connection. Okay, so this is for connection between one network to another network. Okay, so all these notations that you see, 
you're going to use it in your special software known as Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer, my dear students, is an amazing software. You can become expert network engineers by just using this day and night. Okay, it's like a game. Now look, when you design a topology, okay, there are two things you have to remember. When you design a topology, you can the representation can be physical, whereby you say that uh, where are your servers? Where is the switch? Where is the router? Okay. So, for example, you can say this is on um, uh, this room, at this shelf, in this rack, and so on. So, this will be your physical representation. Okay. Mentioning even which room they exist. You can also have a logical representation. In logical representation, you mention the IP address of each of these servers. Okay. Remember that IP address is a logical address that you have to give. Okay. So the moment you see these four octets over here, you know that it is IP version 4 address. So this network is 192.168.10 network. This network is 192.168.11 network. This network is 192.168.100 network. This network is 192.168.101 network. This one is 192.168.102 network. So the moment you see these IP addresses, you know that they are on different networks. For example, here in this network, this address will be, let's say, 192.168.10.1, 192.168.10.2, and so on. Okay? If there are other devices, they will just follow this, okay? All the way from 1 until 254, okay? Now, we'll, why 254? Why it stops over there? We'll study that as well later, okay? So, all these devices will belong to one network. Now, how do you connect this network to the other networks? By using a special device known as a router. This router will enable communication between this, 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 and the cloud and other. Uh, here is its internet. This router will enable the communication to happen. So this is the magical device that makes communication between different networks happen, okay? Now let's look at some common types of networks that we have. You can have a small home network, you can have a small home office network, you can have a medium or large network, or you, you can have a worldwide network, okay? Uh, the possibilities are endless, uh, especially in today's uh, world, okay? Um, it's so easy to, you know, earn money uh, sitting at one place in front of a computer, uh, you know, you can earn uh, so easily without actually <laughs> going out, okay? Like I said that you can publish yourself. Uh, you don't have to go to a renowned publisher and publish your work. You can just go to a blog site, create a blog, and start writing. And depending on how many clicks you get, you can earn money from that. Okay? And these possibilities keep on increasing. Okay? So networks are of different sizes. Um, usually, if you have a network at your home, 
you will have, uh, if you are using uh, the latest system, you will have a fiber optic cable coming to your house. And from that fiber optic cable, usually you get your internet, you get your phone connection, and you get your TV as well at uh, 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 um, a special um, IPTV where you can get so many channels. Okay, and look at the fiber optic cable, a small cable with a small circumference, but it can carry so much of bandwidth. You'll be surprised. <laughs> Why do you think they are laying this thing all around the world? Okay, because it can carry huge bandwidth of data. Now, when you connect different local area networks, okay, through the internet, if you, uh, if you connect them through uh, high-speed uh, data centers like a cloud, uh, then you can actually create a wide area network, okay? So here we see every time when you go out of a local area network, what is the device that you see? Router. Every time you go outside a, a local area network, you see a router. Okay? So a company will have many devices, many switches, but it should have at least one router. Okay? And, you know, routers... Uh, are not exactly cheap. If you get a good quality, a very, very good router, it's not a cheap device. And a router is a device which is always running if you want your network to be always up and running. If a router falls down, a backup router should also immediately take, take its place. You must have witnessed uh, many times uh, Suddenly, uh, you're trying to access Moodle and it goes off. You cannot access Moodle. I'm sure you have experienced this. Why? Because there's no backup system. Okay? Somebody has not done their planning properly, right? <laughs> so, uh, situations like this should not happen. So a local area network uh, is a connection in a small geographical area. Example, our campus. If you look at our campus, we have got so many computer labs. We have got so many computers. Every office where there is a staff member has got a computer. Okay, and they use that computer to communicate with each other. Now, all these com computers are connected to switches. And these switches are connected to an aggregate switch. And these aggregate switches are again connected to each other so that I can communicate with other staff members inside the campus. Okay, now we can still do this, but through the internet. Okay, so now... The internet work that we have is the campus LAN connected to the internet. And the internet is something that I access to communicate with my campus. Okay? As they say over here, you can have multiple branches and you can connect them together by using your routers. Okay? So what is the internet? The connection of all these routers all around the world, my dear students, is your internet. So this is the magical device that makes internet happen. Okay? Um, let's watch this video. If you cannot hear the... Uh, audio, please immediately let me know. There. Welcome to Life Noggin. Thanks to this wonderful thing called the internet, you are watching this video right now. 
but how did the internet get to where it is today? There is so much internet history that we couldn't possibly get to everything in this short of a video. This is from YouTube. Can you hear the audio? Can someone confirm you can hear the audio? Okay, just so we're just definitely going to have to. This video tells you about the basic history of the internet how it started. Make a second one. Anyway, let's get started. The internet actually got its start over 50 years ago, and computers back then filled up entire rooms. Scientists and researchers used it for years to communicate during the Cold War. It was useful because if one computer went down, the others wouldn't follow. In 1962, a scientist named J.C.R. Lickletter proposed the idea of a network of computers that could talk to one another. In 1969, the first ever message was sent from one computer to another over the ARPANET, the government's computer network at the time. ARPANET stands for Advanced Research projects agency. One was located in a research lab in UCLA and the other at Stanford. All the message said was log in and it didn't fail to crash the network. Stanford only received the first two letters of the message, but hey, you gotta start somewhere. By the end of the year, only four computers were connected to this network. In 1971, the University of Hawaii's Aloha Net was added, followed by various networks in London and Norway two years later. Also happening in 1971, Ray Tomlinson was developing the first system to send mail back and forth between the users of ARPANET. This would eventually be called electronic mail or email for short. The at symbol was used to tell a person's name and the host name apart. With all of the networks floating around, there needed to be a way for all of the computers on them to communicate with other networks. This is where computer scientist named Vinton Cerf comes in. He invented a way to introduce computers across the globe to each other in a virtual space. This invention was called Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which was followed by Internet Protocol, or IP. In the 80s, scientists used Cerf's protocol to send data back and forth, but the 90s is where it really all began. In 1991, a computer programmer named Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. This wasn't just a data sharing space for scientists anymore, this was an entire network of information that was accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Now you're using a browser right now to watch this video, and some of the popular ones are Firefox, Google Chrome, and Safari, but in 1992, Erwise was created. Erwise was an internet browser and the first to have a graphical interface. A few browsers came before and after, but in 1993, Mosaic was created and it would popularize surfing the web. Mosaic influenced many of the browsers to follow, including Netscape Navigator in 1994. This became the most popular web browser at the time, accounting for 90% of the web usage in 1995. In the early 90s, companies like AOL and CompuServe were starting to provide dial-up internet access. Dial-up is a method of connecting to the internet via a telephone line. Your telephone line was plugged into a modem and the other end was plugged into the phone jack. There was a period in history where you couldn't use your telephone and the internet at the same time. Without the internet, we obviously wouldn't have things like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but way more importantly, we wouldn't be able to access information in seconds. We wouldn't be able to communicate with people from around the world, share ideas, and educate those who might not get it. So you just get the idea. You can go to this website, um, to this channel, and you know, it's called History of the Internet and have a look later. So right from the beginning of its history in the 60s, ARPANET led the foundation of uh, Internet. And ever since that time, Internet has been growing and growing and growing and growing and actually been surprising us. Okay? Every time something comes in and then we realize, oh my God, we can do this through internet as well. We can do this through internet as well. So many things you can do through the internet. And it will continue surprising us with new breakthroughs and technologies coming in. Okay? So connecting all these wide area networks together creates the internet. Now, nobody owns the internet. It is actually very scary. <laughs> it is something which is out there, uh, having a life of its own, and nobody controls it. The only thing they control is your access to it. And that is usually controlled by a country. A country uh, has uh, its own rules, its own domain, and it can give you access or take away access. Your access right now, if you're connected to the internet, it's because of an internet service provider. That service provider gives you access to your internet. Okay, so you access an ISP. The ISP connects you 
to the other computers in that ISP, which is connected out through a router to the actual World Wide Web, to the Internet. World Wide Web is part of the actual Internet. There's so many other things on the Internet. Okay? There is uh, actual non-governmental bodies that uh, were developed to maintain uh, some structure on the Internet. Uh, one is the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. The other one is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And we also have Internet Architecture Board. Okay? Uh, they try to bring some structure and some order to the Internet, but not actually control it. Okay? So, this is something which is good. We, we, we like it to be um, free as it is right now, okay? If it wasn't, you know, you couldn't even download stuff, intellectual properties that, you know, uh, uh, is very easy to download right now. Uh, it wouldn't have been that easy if uh, it was controlled by an entity. So, if you have a local area network within your enterprise, that is your intranet. If you're giving access to the people who do constant business with your company, then you can create an extranet. And whatever is outside an extranet would be your worldwide web through the internet. Okay? So maintaining this, my dear students, requires experience and skill. Maybe I should say first skill and then experience, okay? And that's why you're here doing this course, because this could be your future uh, uh, work, your future uh, earning. So think about it. If you are interested in this, uh, you can pursue it, and it's very re rewarding career, okay? You start, obviously, with uh, nominal salary, which keeps on increasing because the demand for a network engineer is very high, and every company needs that. For example, think about Curtin. Can we continue without a network engineer? Or any enterprise can we continue without a network engineer? No, we need a network engineer who is actually a very powerful person in the company. Okay, you have to be good to your network engineer, otherwise they can make your life miserable. Okay, so having that in keeping that in mind, you think about pursuing this career. Okay, there is a little bit of aptitude necessary when you study networking. Okay. How do we connect to the internet? So, connecting to the internet these days is actually dependent on which country you are. Some countries do not have the architecture, okay, as we studied. Uh, this architecture that you see is not uh, prevalent. You see, you can see the fiber optic cables going inside the country, but what you have to see is also the, the fiber optic connection within the country, okay? So in Malaysia, we are lucky that we have Unify, okay? Um, one country which has got a, actually a very good connection would be South Korea. Their, their internet connection is really state of the art, okay? So, if you have got fiber optic cable coming into your house, okay? Then you know that, okay, uh, I have got the latest technology right at my doorstep. Now, if you're still uh, connected to the old systems where you have got... Uh, your 
cable is a telephone wire, then perhaps you need to update. Um, the old technology, which was uh, StreamX, okay? Now, some countries, unfortunately, they do not have that infrastructure yet. They're still building, okay? What happens to them? They get, they get left behind, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean, how do you stream? How do you watch Netflix? How do you watch Amazon Prime, okay? How do you... Uh, how do you do uh, business finance if you don't have fast internet? You get left behind. So you see, this is a very important uh, infrastructure for a nation to have, okay? That is why countries who don't invest in this, they get left behind. So having broadband cable, broadband digital, DSL, these are actually the old technologies. And uh, what we have now, the fiber optic broadband, is the state of the art that most of the people around the world use, okay? Every organization needs a faster connection, okay, to support their um, phones. And, you know, if you, if you go to our campus, every office now has got an IP phone. If you go to... Uh, the old building, especially uh, GP3, you will see some of the classrooms have are still stuck with those old analog uh, phones, okay, which still work, okay. Now the connection can be a cable connection. Uh, or a DSL connection, or a cellular connection, or a satellite connection, or a dial-up telephone connection, okay? Uh, if you remember in the olden days, when just now in the video also you got an example of when you used to connect to the internet, you had to go through a special modem, and the internet was very slow in those days. You know, they used to make fun of uh, www. Rather than calling it World Wide Web, they used to call it World Wide Wait. Because the web page used to take so long to load. And even so, you know, when we were designing web pages, we were encouraged not to use pictures or videos. Why? Because it takes a long time to load. Okay. So we had to change our design because of the technology during that time. Okay. And in those days, also, you could watch a movie, but the two hours movie would take you about six hours to watch. You have to, you know, wait until it loads up on your computer, and that takes forever. And we were still patiently sitting there and watching. <laughs> Those were the days, yeah. Uh, so very soon we had got DSL that came in using the existing uh, telephone cables. We made our internet much more faster, okay? But now, using the latest fiber optic cable, our infrastructure has become much better, so much so that we can even stream, okay, through our internet. So every corporate business wants higher bandwidth, wants dedicated connections, wants managed services. Some businesses, they have got a dedicated lease line straight to the internet service provider. Example. Our university curtain, our connection is a T1 lease line connection to the uh, internet service provider. In, in, in Malaysia, it's TM, okay? We also have satellite connection, especially in places where you don't have a wired infrastructure. This is something useful in places um, like in Sarawak, if you go to the interior sections of Borneo, uh, where there is no uh, wired service in the jungles, then you can have this. You should know that in this day and age, our network is getting converged. 
In early days, there was a special cable for the carry, for carrying your uh, voice, another cable for video, another cable for data. But now we have got one cable carrying everything. Okay, it can be <laughs> uh, a cable which takes care of. Uh, uh, voice, data, video, everything, okay? So that's why we call it a converged network, okay? Like I said, if you look at your internet, if you have got the fiber optic cable coming to your house, you can see that it supports your phone, it supports your cable, you have got TV channels, and you have got your internet as well, so many things. It can um, give you a service for all, everything, okay? So this converging network actually is responsible for your data, for your voice, for your video, and much, much more, okay? Because the bandwidth is huge. If you look at uh, an internet uh, minute, how much of data is being transferred? Okay, uh, look at all these websites that we use, okay? The cake among all would be your streaming sites, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and of course, YouTube. Perhaps many of you have got your own channel. Some of you are creating your own videos. Uh, who knows? Everybody wants to create videos and upload it on YouTube and make money. Um, all that requires huge bandwidth, okay? So, um, how, how do we do that? By having a higher infrastructure. A few years ago, there was a discussion that, you know, streaming sites like uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime, uh, they should have a higher, they should pay higher because you see, uh, they say half of all the traffic is YouTube and all the streaming sites. They take the chunk because... Many people like to stream now, okay? And if you look at the movies being released, uh, most of them, you know, ever since the pandemic, one company who has done very well is Netflix, okay? Uh, it is now much more valuable than all the studios put together in Hollywood, okay? So look at the major movies coming out. You will see the it's mostly under the banner of Netflix, okay? So... A few years ago, there was a discussion that these, these uh, streaming companies should pay higher for, the, for using the service of the internet because most of the data traveling in is theirs. Okay, so there was that discussion going on. Okay. Now, in order to create our basic network simulation, we will be using a software which you are going to download from Netacad today the latest one, and that software is known as Cisco Packet Tracer. I'm gonna show you this software uh, on my computer. Uh, there, Cisco Packet Tracer, I'm gonna open it. When you open it, the first thing it's gonna ask you is enter your username and password. Now, I don't have to do that because I've already entered. Your username and your password is your Cisco account which I'm gonna create for you today. You don't have a Cisco account yet, okay? So you don't exist as far as Netacad is concerned, but today you will be born and exist on Netacad. So this is what your latest packet tracer looks like, okay? So what I want you to do today is perhaps uh, take this packet tracer, uh, download it and create a basic network. Okay, here we go. We create a basic computer network. One PC, okay, connected to another PC. Uh, we can say uh, this PC, I'll give it an IP address of 192.16, sorry. 168.1.1, okay? 
with this PC. 192.168.1.2. Sorry, dot two. Okay. So I'm going to connect this PC with this PC using a cable, okay? Now, I'm going to use a straight through cable initially connected to the network interface fast Ethernet zero here to the next PC's fast Ethernet zero, okay? Now, when I do that, immediately you see these red triangles. When you see these red triangles, you can know that, hey, something is wrong. There's no connection. Why? Because when you have a PC to PC connection, you cannot use a straight through cable. You have to use a crossover cable. Okay? Now, this straight through cable and crossover cable are the UTP cables that we have the industry standard, okay? Straight through, the wires are the same at both ends. Crossover, the wire arrangement is different. There are eight wires, each having a unique color code. How you arrange them, you're going to learn that as well. So let's delete this, okay? Delete it. Now let's use crossover cable. Again, cross over. The moment you do this, can you see the green triangle? The moment you get a green triangle, that means hallelujah, everything is okay. There's no problem. Okay, now let's look at the connection. You have done a physical connection, very good, but you can still not communicate with each other. Why? Because you have not given an IP address. Okay, so let's give an IP address. Okay, so we go to the desktop. We select IP configuration. I give a static IP address, 192.168.1.1. Subnet mask will automatically come in as 255.255.255.0. Okay, details about subnet mask we'll study later, okay? Just remember the subnet mask is, is something which is the same for the network, okay? So here we have to give another IP address. This is for this PC. Now for this PC also I'm going to give the IP address. 192.168.1.2. Since it's the same network, it's going to be the same subnet mask, okay? Now you have given the IP address. Now you can ping to each other. Let's start with this PC, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my desktop, Go to my command prompt, and in the command prompt, I'm going to type IP config. So it tells me what is my IP address. There, 192.168.1.1. Okay. So I'm going to ping to 192.168.1.2. So what I do is I type ping. 192.168.1.2. You can see you get four replies. Okay, that means the connection is good. Okay, you just managed to ping from 
your PC0 to PC1. What about the other way? Let's do the other way. Command prompt, ping 192.168.1.1. Okay, let's ping there. You just managed to ping to this PC. So the network is perfect. You just created a simple peer-to-peer -peer network. What if I want to ping a PC like number 10? Do I have a IP address 10? No. So when I ping, what happens? It's trying to look for it. You see? You see? You get something called request timed out. That means it cannot find it. So you get four replies, request timed out four times. Okay? So the echo request that you get back, that means there is no IP address 10 or it cannot find it. Okay? So a basic network is something we are going to create today on our packet tracer. So this is your packet tracer with all the connections, which we'll be doing today. Moving on. We go to reliable networks, okay? Before I continue, anyone has any questions, my dear students? Okay, okay. Okay, fine. If you have something in your mind and you cannot, um, you can just type it out, okay? I will look at the, I've got another computer here where I just look at the chats, okay? In order to have a reliable system, you should have a network which takes care of these four components. Your network should be fault tolerant. If, like I said, if one switch fails, another should take over. If that important device, which is your, what is that most important device in your network? Your router, if it fails, you should have a backup router taking its place. Okay? Your network should be scalable. That means you should have room to add on new network components, okay? It should be easy to add new devices. If I'm going to add a new lab at Curtin tomorrow because of the higher number of students, it should be easy for me to do so, okay? It should give a good service. The quality of the service should not be compromised. And of course, it should have security so that people who are not uh, relevant and people who are, do not have, should not have access to the system cannot access it, okay? The places where you keep your network equipment should not be a place where people can go in and come out. No, it should be a locked room where people do not have access to it. Okay? Like I said, if one router fails, another one takes over. Okay, you have a backup router. Okay? You have got, we say, redundant connections. It should be fault tolerant. If you want to add new computers, new devices to your network, it should be easy to do so. That is why the initial planning, when you plan your network in your future jobs, when you're working for an enterprise, uh, your boss will tell you, I'm going to design, we want to create a new network for this branch, and we are giving you uh, the task to do it. So please fly to Vietnam and do that, okay? I had a student 
uh, back when I was working in JB, I had a student whose job was this. The company was sending him all around Southeast Asia, Philippines, one month in Philippines, one month in Vietnam, one month in, uh, you know, um, sometimes he has to go to Singapore uh, because it was a Singapore-based company, um, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, just to do their network, okay? And this guy hasn't, didn't, ha had not even finished his, uh, didn't have a basic degree, but what he had was his CCNA one, two, three, four. In those days, it was one, two, three, four. Now they've changed it to only one, two, three. So he only had the uh, CCNA one, two, three, four. And initially he wasn't even good at it, but because of the experience and doing it over and over, his demand was so high that his salary shot up, okay? And now he's one of the, uh, and he earns very good uh, money, okay? Because they need him. If they want to <laughs> uh, set up a network, they send him to that place or any other place and say, go and fix it, okay? So like I said, it's a very rewarding career. So the first thing you have to do is plan to make sure that your network is scalable. When you create a plan, when you do a blueprint topology, you should have scalability in mind. You should ensure that the quality of your service, okay, is perfect. You cannot, uh, you should make sure that, you know, uh, the priorities, like uh, the communication, the data, the video, everything is good. Okay, nothing is compromised. You see, whenever you are transmitting voice and video, uh, you should ensure that, you know, uh, especially if you're, let's say you're streaming, and the quality, if you're streaming something which is uh, uh, 4K, <laughs> uh, you should get it in 4K and the quality should not be compromised. Otherwise, what are you paying for, correct? So that is an issue that you have to think about. And of course, security, okay? Only authorized people can access your network. Not just every, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry can come in and... No, you have to, as a network engineer, you have to have certain rules because at the end of the day, you are responsible. Even the IT manager does not have access to the network as the network engineer. Sometimes the network engineer is the most is the is the high, high, highest paid person because everything rests on that person. Okay, if something sometimes he gets you know a midnight call, something wrong with the network, so he has to go and act, go to the um, site and fix the problem. Okay, so one thing as a network engineer that you have to take into consideration is the security of the network, okay? Who has access, physical access to the places where you have got your devices like routers and switch, you should know. And those places should always be locked, okay? You have been in curtain for how long? Have you ever seen the rooms where they keep all the switches or the routers? I'm sure you have not. Why? Because it's locked. <laughs> it's, you even don't know what, which device. You just go to the lab and to offices and you see that the computer has got a cable and that cable goes to the roof, to the fall ceiling called the plenum. And from there, where it goes, you never know. Okay? That is only for the... IT staff and network engineer to know, okay? And the network engineer doesn't, uh, if he's smart, he won't reveal all his secrets, okay? Because once you troubleshoot something, you become good at it, you can, you know, people will be dependent on you and they will be willing to pay you more 
just to make sure that their network is up and running, okay? During exam time, suddenly I cannot access Moodle. What do you do? You email the lecturer, you email, you complain about it to, uh, you know, uh, different people. So who, who hears the brunt of it? That is the network engineer, okay? So the net network engineer probably will be losing his job or her job, okay? So you have to take into consideration all these things, okay? It's a rewarding career, but, uh, you know, it, it, many sleepless nights, especially if in the beginning you don't know your thing, okay? And your hair will be white very soon <laughs> because a lot of worries. Okay. Some of the trends that we are going to go through or still going through are uh, bring your own device trend whereby um, rather than, you know, going to a place where there is already computers, you are encouraged to bring your own device. A few years ago, there was discussion back in our campus that uh, we don't have any more computer labs. We we remove the computer labs from the campus. No need to invest in computer labs and um, getting the software and hardware and, you know, no need to do that. Every time we have a new student who joins the campus, joins Curtin, we give them a new notebook, a computer. Yeah, this is your notebook. That's it. That was, we were discussing to do this, but then somehow it was not uh, done. Okay, because many issues and, you know, pros and cons were taken into consideration. So this is a new trend, you know, wherever you go, just bring your own device. And, you know, uh, our smartphones are getting uh, much more uh, uh, competent and much more better. Uh, and, you know, we can do anything on a smartphone that you can do on a computer and a PC. Okay, most of the things. Uh, there's online collaboration, there's video communication. What we are doing right now is a video communication, cloud computing. All of these are some of the trends that we are having right now, okay? Uh, so bring your own device allows the users to have freedom to use personal tools to access using their own devices can be, you know, uh, smartphones, laptop, netbooks, tablets, e-readers, wh whatever, okay? And wherever you go, the only thing you ask for is, what is your Wi-Fi password? What is your connection password, okay? And online collaboration by using Cisco WebEx. This is exactly what we are doing right now. You will agree with me, okay? Uh, this is exactly what we're doing right now. All of you uh, are over here, okay? Uh, 23 participants, uh, I mean, including me, 24 participants, okay? Uh, all together through WebEx doing an online collaboration, okay? Isn't technology amazing? So doing a video call like this and having a class, okay, online, is something possible with today's technology. Another aspect of our uh, networking is having cloud computing, okay, where we can store all our data on the cloud as long as we have got enough space, okay? You can have massive data centers, okay? Uh, so sometimes these data centers can be leased, okay? You have got many places in the world, you know, sometimes in the middle of the desert, they open these data centers with redundant connections, which are uh, backed up in other geographical locations, okay? so. Uh, Data is very important in today's world, and we have got ways and means of 
uh, storing it. And we have got specialized services that provide us this, uh, you know, this service. And all we have to do is start using it. If we want to use a premium uh, account, we have to pay for it. Otherwise, a basic service uh, for a single use, uh, for, for a, you know, a personal use is usually free. But if you're using for your company, then you have to perhaps uh, pay a, a small fee, a, usually a yearly fee, and you can get uh, a good service to save your uh, data on the cloud. So we have got public clouds, private clouds, hybrid clouds, custom clouds, okay? Each curtail to a, uh, to a specific need and a specific service. We have got the smart home technology, uh, a lot of research going on with, uh, you know, uh, implementation by using IoT and so on, okay? This is, uh, many uh, technologies have been out and many students uh, sometimes use their final year project topics based on these. Another technology that we have, I don't know if you have witnessed this, okay? Uh, John, you, you say we don't have face. What do you mean by that? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. D did you mean we don't have a video? Okay, okay. <laughs> I put you on the spot. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I thought it was a genuine question. Okay, Le um, another technology that we have now, I have used this technology, it's amazing is sending um, uh, network uh, signals through the through uh, electricity, through your uh, current, okay? Uh, this is something amazing. The, 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 the best thing is your signal goes through the same wire as your electric current. What is the benefit of that? You don't have to regenerate the signal because the current will give it enough power to carry it to its destination. All you need to do is use a special uh, uh, a modem to convert your that electricity signal back into uh, the the network signal. Okay. Uh, I remember I, I traveled to Shalom um, uh, in Malaysia itself. There was this hotel which was using this technology. Their internet was through their <laughs> cables. Uh, in, in through the power cable, so you just uh, plug in a special uh, uh, router, uh, come modem inside there, uh, power outlet, and from there you can connect your internet. It was amazing. Okay, so this is a another technology that we have. We also have wireless broadband. Okay. Uh, still getting popular where you can access uh, the internet uh, wirelessly through your devices. Now we go to a very important aspect of uh, networking, which is security, okay? As a network engineer, you should always have plan for your security. If you don't plan, this is going to come and bite you in a very bad way, okay? Having a software-based firewall is very important. Having an actual physical firewall is also very important to protect your network. Remember, at the end of the day, as a network engineer, you are the only person responsible. If something goes uh, 
wrong with your network, people will look at you, nobody else, okay? So you have to protect yourself, okay? When we talk about network security, you should protect yourself against certain threats. Now, these threats can be viruses, worms, and Trojan horses, okay? Viruses are uh, special software that, you know, uh, you have to physically transfer them from one place to another place. Worms are also the special software that harm your computer, just like viruses, except the worms can make copies of themselves and send it to all the other network components. Trojan horses are special software which appear to be useful and friendly, but in the background, they are doing actual uh, data gathering or harming your system. Okay, sometimes they collect information uh, from your system and send it to a uh, undisclosed location. Okay, uh, like banking information or um, keystrokes that you type on your keyboard and all that. We also have spyware and adware. Um, that's why it's very important, you know. As a network engineer, you have to keep on telling your uh, your your uh, network users in your local area network. We have to send them instructions and say, if you get an email with an attachment saying that you have won 5,000 ringgit, please click on this link. Do not click on a link. Nobody's going to send you 5,000 ringgit out of the blue. You know, you have to keep on educating people. Uh, people can be uh, PhD holders, but when it comes to Basic uh, intelligence, sometimes, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, you'll be surprised. Uh, very easy to uh, dupe people and, you know, um, it's actually very silly, but it's it's very easy. People fall for the, uh, for the easiest uh, cons, okay? So, so you have to uh, educate. You have to say, if you get this link, do not click on it. If somebody sends you an email saying that they have a video of you doing this and that, transfer this many Bitcoins in my name, do not be scared. <laughs> um, uh, there is no such thing. Uh, if somebody, um, of course, if somebody, uh, if you have already clicked on a link and then that link, uh, downloads a software that changes, uh, that, you know, locks all your files and, you know, you just expose yourself to a ransomware. The only way you can, <laughs> you can remove that, uh, uh, that uh, lock uh, and you decrypt that encryption that has been imposed on your files is by paying a certain amount of money. And many companies, you know, uh, a few years ago, we had got so many ransomware attacks. Some companies, they just pay because they calculate that the, the, the access to data is so important for them, they might as well pay the person. Okay, so just they pay the person. You also have zero-day attacks. Now, the zero-day attacks are uh, when there is a new attack that there is no antivirus for, okay? Uh, there is a documentary about that zero day, so you can have a look at that. Uh, it's a very interesting documentary. Sometimes there is a person who attacks a company, okay, a threat actor. You also have denial of service attacks when a website gets so many requests that it cannot, uh, uh, it cannot uh, continue. Uh, servicing all those requests and it just stops working, okay? Um, data theft, identity theft, okay? So actually these things are very easy to do. You can, uh, very easy to just go on Facebook and steal someone's identity, okay? You can have internal threats as well, lost or stolen devices, uh, misused by employees, malicious employees, you know, people who want to harm the company. You know, you've got all kinds of uh, situations. 
So as a network engineer, you have to create a security solution. You should create a blueprint. You are at the end responsible for your network's security. Remember that. You have to make sure that everything is tip top. So you are responsible. So plan, okay? Have a solution. Draw the topology with a security solution. You should have a dedicated firewall system. You should have access control list. What is access control list? Unfortunately, you will not learn this in CCNA 1. This is something you will learn in CCNA 2 and 3. Okay? You should have an intrusion prevention system. You should have a VPN, a virtual private network. These are some of the solutions that you can implement. Okay? So, as a network engineer, you have to be a professional. Uh, IT professional, and some ways you can go for this is through the certification that Cisco provides, that is CCNA, CCNP, and CCIE, okay? So these will actually make you expert in the field. Now, there is another uh, entity out there, which is Huawei. They have got their own certification as well, okay? Uh, they are out there with their own networking components. And that's why the competition is something that the U.S. is not happy with. And that has created so many issues as well. Okay. So these are some of the job opportunities that uh, a networking job can bring. That brings us to the end of this session. Now, do you have any questions before we move forward? Anyone else? Thanks, Cassandra. Anyone else? Okay, so this is our first uh, video, uh, sorry, first lecture. I've been recording it and I'll be uploading it. So have a look at this video. And today I'll be recording another session, which is your CCNA 2 for the afternoon group. Now, you people may not be there because you've got other classes, but, but please go and have a look at that video before you come for the next session next week, okay? So now let's move on.